Hello everyone. Good morning and welcome to Vishwa Talks. My name is Srivani. Thank you so much for each of you for attending this talk. For those of you who have attended a Vishwa Talk before, a very warm welcome to you. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, here's a little bit about us. Vishwa Talks is an initiative by Vishwa. Vishwa.org is an online platform for everyday change makers and social champions. It's a crowdfunding platform. It's a crowdsourcing platform that is aimed to help anyone, to support anyone in finding when they want to contribute to society, to the environment, to solve their problems for themselves and for others. And in the process, to make our world a better place. Vishwa Talks is a series of weekly webinars hosted every Saturday that are focused on gaining an in-depth knowledge from the experts on a wide range of topics that are pertinent to our current context. Today's Vishwa Talks is brought to you in partnership with Creative B Foundation. a Hyderabad-based NGO that has been working to support the lives of handloom and handicraft artisans for over two decades. Our speaker today is Mrs. Bina Rao, the founder and the managing trustee of Creative Bee Foundation. Creative Bee Foundation provides artisans with product design, development support, skill developing training, and management capacity building. Ms. Bina has a master's degree in fine arts from Maharaja Sayoji Rao University, Vadodara, and has studied textile design through an AEP program at NID Ahmedabad. She has spent most of her life advocating for policies and implementing interventions that help artisan community market their products in India and abroad. She has been on several advisory committees of the Ministry of Textiles, Government of India. She is an international consultant for the United Nations. She has been on the guest jury of some of the biggest design schools in India, including NIFT. And her sustainable fashion labels, Bina Rao and Creative B, have been showcased at the Lakme Fashion Show Week and at some very acclaimed international fashion shows too. Today, she's going to talk to us about the importance and the urgency of supporting our handloom artisans for their conservation and their promotion. Because this art form, if not nourished, is going to, we're going to lose it soon. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that our speaker will be taking questions from each of you or any of you who would like to ask after this main talk. Please raise a hand or type your questions in the chat box. The raise hand button will be at the bottom. Now, if I may invite our speaker, Ms. Bina, to please start today's Vishwa talk. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm really delighted to see uh, the diverse audience that that has taken out time on this Saturday morning and come here. Unlike my usual uh, textile design institute uh, students and museum uh, groups and you know uh, textile symposium enthusiasts, uh, I'm really excited and looking forward to share my views with you all. I also see a lot of known names of uh, handloom warriors who have been my my seniors and who have been with me fighting uh, the fight for the handloom weaving sector. I'm really delighted. And I thank Mrs. Srivani and Vishwa team for pulling me out to do this session. I have been, uh, I have so many things going on in my mind at the same time, you know, the pandemic crisis for the weavers and then, you know, uh, the kind of uh, export markets are just opening. So coping up with uh, that thing. So uh, today's topic, uh, 
um, is like uh, it's this how weavers have woven our cultural identity, you know, and that topic speaks a lot. I would say weavers have not only woven our cultural identity, but our Indian weavers have woven the very fashion trends in Europe. Um, without touching the history, I cannot do justice to my today's topic. However, I will be brief. And if you need to know more, because history is vast, Indian textile history, trade um, textiles, so-called trade textiles and the Silk Route and East India Company, number of books have been written. But any of you who are students or curious to know anything, there is a Q&A session as uh, Mrs. Vani has mentioned. So I'm open to the questions. Um, moving on to the main subject, uh, 1500 years onwards, I mean, uh, year 1500 onwards, the exotic handcrafted textiles uh, became rage of the world. First came the Dutch traders, Dutch and French traders, followed by East India Company. With every shipment of East India Company reaching European shore, a new trend of fashion began. I'm not exaggerating the kind of demand that it created with various prints, colors, textures from uh, various regions of India. We are culturally and historically so rich in our textiles that even today, after we lost so many art forms and textile forms and techniques in these hundred years, we still have uncountable uh, weaves and techniques. Uh, European clothing and furnishing, which were limited to just a crew, black, gray, uh, monotonous color uh, palette and trends, um, they were immediately transformed into, uh, you know, uh, fashion trends, which are dictated by Indian textiles. Also chins and indigo, they are like timeless trends. They have remained for centuries. They are even now popular and coming back. As you see, the Indian textiles, I have n number of examples to show you and each one of you, those who are sari wearers and those who are wearing Indian clothing will have in their uh, almaras n number of uh, beautiful textile samples. Um, but at the same time, when we were trading our textiles nicely and you know we were like hands full of orders from European traders, at the same time, we also had a uninterrupted patronage from our royal uh, royalties, you know, the Nawabs and the Kings and the Sultan, Maharajas. And the beauty of the whole cultural context of that phase that I really enjoy reading about and knowing about is that a common man wore handloom and the royals were, wore handloom and, you know, handloom was part of the barter system. So we were never had to worry about what would happen to my precious, uh, my production of the month or of a week, you know. And uh, you see this beautiful little princess uh, from Hyderabad province, uh, so beautifully decked up in this uh, brocade. Um, so this was the golden uh, era. And also men, men didn't have any meal-made coats or pants or, you know, they also had to wear uh, the handloom attire. You can see the ikat shawls and stoles, brocades, jamevars. Um, it was like, I mean, I always regret that I was not born in that era, you know, and uh, look at these beautiful little girls and little women. I mean, from child to middle age to the oldest person, they, they, they wore their own handwoven uh, textiles with such a pride. And um, so this was the time when uh, our own demand was also there and um, only for uh, decades or two, but I mean, uh, the world traders were really, you know, thriving on Indian textiles and what has gone wrong between that time and today, that was the time golden era of handloom, what we call, um, I really wonder what has gone wrong between that time and today, there are hardly, I think, one and a half century away we are. And we all know about the post-independence phase of uh, Mill revolution in India. You may also call it a industrial revolution. You may have studied as industrial revolution. And you also know that mid 18th century, the chemical dyes and the screen printing techniques were invented. And that was also, I'm not indulging into details of history, but those who are students here 
would uh, can read up go home and read up as how uh, print printing came into existence because chins became so popular india could not meet the demand of chins because chins is a hand painted kalamkari form which is from mashuli patnam was then later adopted by persian block printers in um, uh, you know around region uh, of andhra pradesh all other villages shri kalahasti is the only village that is remain today which does chins means hand painted kalamkari but the the screen printing was the result of huge demand of this chins type of textiles across europe and um, but this uh, invention of chemical dye and um, screen printing has cut into our handloom supply chain immediately the order started declining and by mid 1800 the mill made yarn was available for indian weavers that was another thing that you call it a boon or you call it a, you know uh, i don't know i mean because i as a professional textile practitioner and a designer i look at the history in a very different perspective because do, making a uh, yarn by machine was one thing and then using machine made yarn and making fabric by machine was completely a different thing and um, it was by mid 1800 the mill made yarn we were started using and at that time the difference of mill made hand woven and hand spun hand woven so uh, then political movement capitalized on this so khadi term was coined for hand spun and hand woven which became a very powerful symbol of swadeshi and quit india movement uh, we all know about it um, and uh, this khadi and uh, hand spun is a very again a very very vast subject now there are certain norms that everybody and anybody cannot use term khadi it's been patented but this is just for the general knowledge of the audience here i would like to say that the difference i would have uh, been happy if i was in that era that handloom and khadi were walking together you know handloom khadi got a different kind of a status from handloom because it became politically symbolic fabric which is very good but handloom should have not been put on a back seat the first question to, that comes to my mind that when our handloom textiles have met the world demand for centuries not only one or two decades you know or one or two centuries for years um, the first woven fabric that were found at mohenjodaro 5000 years ago our civilization and cotton was produced then so we have been for thousands of years using we were self reliant and um, why power loom had to come into and cut into our ecosystem was it a political decision or it's can i call it a premature ambition whatever i leave it at that to the audience to ponder about it and if but i must say that from that day till today power loom has crunched into our handloom sector and every day government is making very huge good efforts to make handloom distinct keep uh, power loom away from encroaching uh, the products which are only made by handloom should be made only by handloom and then there has been list been published and uh, they say that you cannot make these things on power loom but you know i mean country as big as ours the implications are so much that the uh, imposition of law that you can make only this for hand by handloom and this you cannot make i mean it does not really work well making yarn by machine as i said was one thing and um, i didn't understand why country of our size had to switch to uh, power loom um, we uh, our weavers the number of uh, looms that we had i'm going to show in the next slide that even just about uh, 30 years ago we had still huge number of looms trying working and thriving so we could have very well um been uh, self sufficient in providing clothing for our own country we should have continued at least to do that um so the post independence phase that we have arrived now from the glorious phase of handloom um and uh, now i'm going to briefly take you through uh, what has happened post independence um because yarn the handloom the mill made yarn arrived before 
independence. Chemical dyes and screen print, everything arrived just before a couple of decades before independence. And uh, we had uh, the largest cooperative and the first cooperative that was made by government of India was Cooptex in Tamil Nadu. So to counter the power loom, the damage that power loom may do, uh, it's not that government didn't uh, do, uh, didn't try to safeguard. So Cooptex was made as a, one of the largest uh, cooperative society that even today it exists and it has been making profits. Um, and then within no time, I mean, I think within the next 15 years, we had large number of cooperative uh, societies being formed in different states. And um, um, the East India Company was dissolved by then, you know. So we didn't have demand outside uh, our country so much. And within the country, because power loom was a new fad, the mill made textures, mill made fabrics was so. Uh, this slide particularly is just an information slide. Here it shows the old census of uh, looms and what you see in the fine print there are the number of uh, products or number of regions. If you enlarge, I have given the wikimedia.org link down there. So if you could later enlarge and try to read how many different regions, how many weaves, you know, I mean, Whenever Shri, uh, Shrivani and myself, we talk about Indian textiles and weaves and I, we really lose the count because um, each region has, even if you take only five techniques, just for weaving, I'm not talking about printing, embroidery, just five techniques of weaving and you multiply into 28 states and eight union territories, how many weaves we have. So uh, this is this slide you can uh, yourself explore. Now here you see, this is the picture before COVID, just three years ago when we enrolled 2000 women weavers from Telangana, uh, who were the weavers and ancillary workers who are not master weavers, who are not master of their own earnings. They, they would, I would hate to use the word, a local word called Kuli weavers, but they were Kuli weavers. They were transformed into, by training, in good quality dyeing by governance by you know there are educated young girls also who are by force became uh, weavers uh, i mean I, they had to just take up weaving as their vocation because they were in the villages so seven villages across telangana uh, we realized that there is need to uh, build the skill infrastructure education first and foremost education so creative foundation's latest initiative is I would talk about it at the end, is for education of senior weavers and senior vendors, women, because they need to manage their account at least. They need to be able to do Google Pay. They need to know how money can be saved and can go into, because the old chitty and all those methods have gone now, you know, uh, that's outdated and um, they should be aware of, uh, I shouldn't get very passionate about uh, my that project and I should continue uh, on to my next slide where there is a lot to be discussed about. Uh, so I would now straight away bring you to post-1960 uh, where a fast development, you know, I must say our country uh, has really done well and it's done every opportunity that world had we wanted to have for ourselves. And that's how the first Design Institute that was set up in 1961, that was NID. I feel uh, very fortunate to have studied there. Um, and followed by NIFT. NIFT has, has now 20 uh, locations. NID also from two years ago, thanks to our uh, previous uh, textile minister and textile ministry that they saw the need to expand. And uh, so uh, I have given the list there for the students, how many NID new campuses are there. So. Uh, why I'm coming to this, uh, this topic, not for I want to speak about my institute or any other design institute, but uh, the whole formula or the synthesis of my 30 years that I have mentioned in my, uh, my marketing, sorry, publishing video that was made, a short video, I was saying that I have insight into the handloom spectrum after working 30 years as a trained designer and a person who has you know, tried to make beautiful handwoven products. And today, post COVID, we are so distressed. So I would want to run you through the basic difference between a designer handloom and a branded 
designer handloom you call it or you can call it a branded handloom which is a b handloom from remote villages of india where no designer intervention has reached my new label kabir will tell you about that which we will talk about at the end um so uh, the design schools uh started mushrooming and uh, design in intervention in handloom is not easy see as a training as a getting trained as a designer say it's a three years program or five years program and you are trained in quality dyeing number of weaves you weave on your own sample loom you have exposure you have touch and go exposure to everything the whole spectrum of uh, textile design if you are have taken textile as a discipline uh, industrial and handloom and three years time or five years time not enough for anyone to really train you for everything but it's your call you know once you you have learned about things how to explore it further so um if you look at uh, the design intervention in handloom industry uh, i i shouldn't say that my journey of uh, 30 years had been like uh, you know cake walk first 10 years was very difficult because uh, as i'm explaining here to design uh, to do design intervention in handloom is not easy at all and uh, it requires a facility you know it took us 10 years to create the facility sort of integrated facility which take care of the all uh, phases of value chain you know all steps of value chain that goes into uh, making a good quality handloom those of you who have background of textiles will know that just from harmful azo dyes to azo free dyes the moving from those practicing dyes uh, like uh, naphthols and those carcinogenic dyes getting the artisan or weavers move to safe dyes azo free dyes like vat reactive and natural dyes is a different story altogether because natural dye requires lot of training and a proper setup even azo azo free dyes anyone and everyone cannot practice because number one you don't get the dyes at your source you are in the village you don't even have any brand on your packet of dye that you buy the weaver i'm talking about so i mean somebody a buyer sitting in bombay delhi or abroad just tells weavers group that okay we want azo free dyes weavers very much needy and say yes yes we do azo free dyes but what is the guarantee that the dye that you're getting is azo free and where is the supply source i have been requesting when i am on the board of uh, advisory board to the ministry of textiles that nhdc should stop at village level and not in at town level the azo free dyes along with the good quality yarn also um so doing natural dye as i said is is another uh, more popular uh, uh, what do you say uh, trend emerging now but that's again not easy because the the knowledge that we lost about uh, 80 years ago uh, i say lost because what we are doing in machhli patnam kalahasti or any other region the practicing or uh, gujarat or rajasthan is not 100% um what do you say the technique that we had due to various reasons we had to cut short our natural dye practices to uh, quick production and that has resulted into uh, color not being fast to make color fast you need to create a infrastructure like what creative we has at a dye farm it took us 10 years my husband rao had done huge r&d to arrive at uh, uh, a stage now where we can do washable natural dyes this particular visual i'm trying to show uh, that anyone any trained designer thinks that just by giving a paper design um, a weaver is going to understand or can produce a qualitative designer or branded textile that's a mistake that they do see here you see me as a young designer and you see an ikat design which was very abstract was woven for the first time by the cooperative society but it was a huge effort uh also upada sarees i'm quickly running you through all these because there is so much to talk about upada sarees the scale is very important or any weaving the scale the designer sitting in any city or a studio has to understand that by if you don't provide a design on graph weaver is not going to understand what is the scale of the design that you are looking at there are various this this uh, double ikat 
just by small cutting a swatch that you give to a weaver weaver will not be able to understand what yarn has gone just by his expertise on experience he can say that this is 2 by 120s this is 2 by 60s but there could be an ambiguity and a graph who's making the graph don't people who are making graph are designers weavers are the biggest designers they have born with the talent they have learned the talent of weaving designing making graph right from their childhood so they are very well big trained designers we are just nothing we have just gone to d school for 3 years or 5 years and you know we we just cannot uh, dictate terms with those people and say that oh you spoiled it you done this so my sustainable fashion is all about um, the whole formula that how uh, a handloom industry and handloom fashion can be sustainable that you have to be very kind to the sector in many ways of course today's topic is not about sustainable fashion but those who are can uh, uh, youtube they can go into youtube and search for my exclusive uh, talks at various uh, country as uh, country symposiums and also like my fashion week uh, the first day session was on sustainable fashion which i did for all like my designers uh, who were participating in that year so uh, the value chain quickly i want to run everyone those who are not familiar with the value chain that is involved in weaving not only weaving but various stages of making a beautiful textile so quickly i'm just running through it making of warp making of weft stretching your warp into the street you don't have your factory you don't have your you know a, a huge working studio you every village is a studio for a weaver you know and in hot sun in any weather did we provide them pillows did we provide them air condition near their loom do, do we have enough lighting given to them no we don't we do we haven't so how can we expect that the the fabric or the product that will come out will be flawless will be timely produced you know there could be a 42 degrees here in telangana and weavers cannot go out in the street to stretch their warp so your production is going to be delayed see how cumbersome it is for age group if you notice as soon as uh, your children are say 15 16 and they start teenage cross teenage and start going to school in the evening they come and help the support the family but this was the phenomenon before covid covid is a different thing altogether and we come back to it 5 minutes later uh, let's run through uh, see how curious the weavers are and they are how ardently they are taking the training this is one of our training in the puttapaka village and uh, those seven villages that i was talking about as of free dies being taught women of all age group even my uh, trainees were 65 70 years old group, age group and then they become trainers trainees they have learned the young ones have learned and look at the smile on the i would want to see the smile like this on all the weavers faces across the country um, she's earning better formed she's part of the max society after training what has been formed she's retailing her fabric at four times more price than what she was earning earlier now talking about the country the vastness of the country this is a region called bassa a tribal region handful of weavers are holding on to the knowledge and creative bee foundation and creative bee has been working with this weavers ever since i found them which was about say 25 years ago uh, and they make dye out of the root of the tree which is called kal and the process with cow dung and the entire process is so time taking again my lecture on uh, endangered indian textile at uh, san francisco museum d young museum is online people students can search for the entire talk is on how this all dye is going to be extinct soon uh, look at the ingredients the value and the supply chain that is involved in weaving in dyeing and in printing is very long and unless you nurture this value chain at every level you are not going to get the best product so this is this is creative be set up of course as i told you it took us 10 years block making again if your blocks are not carved in good wood and if not carved in seasoned wood because 
to cut down the cost. If buyer is not paying for the blocks, if buyer is um, being, uh, you know, skeptical about, oh, why should I pay for the block? Then weaver is, uh, printer is forced to make cheaper wood block and then it would not uh, print the quality printing. So many uh, aspects are involved to make the best quality uh, design in which is handmade, which we did, which we did centuries ago. The world was crazy about our textiles and making natural dye and uh, the, the improve the quality of what Machili Patnam is now losing out on uh, uh, is what is needed. Now, quickly, see, I am very conscious about the time and I'm quickly running to my uh, key, key tone, uh, what do you say, keynote uh, message that post pandemic, how each one of us can help viewers and coming to that, I'm now talking about handloom, which is B, which is non-designer handloom. Designer handloom in the country, I think there are a handful of uh, designer brands, designer uh, labels who are exclusively working with handmade and sustainable textiles. Um, but if you see the number, the map that I showed you, if you see the scale or number of weavers and artisans across India is so huge. And who's marketing their produce? My question to the audience today is that, aren't we buying uh, rice and dal and vegetables which are produced in remote villages? Don't they have organized angadi? Don't the farmers have uh, small or big organized marketing? Where is the, that marketing for us? Where is Where handloom sector has that marketing network? So earlier cooperatives and the cooperatives which happened in past 20 years, almost running with uh, uh, very stressful kind of a finances. Also, the government scheme that were made, every government would want to give enough money to every sector, you know, for growth and enough money under schemes. But then when one government or one office bearer move and the new office bearer come, the very concept of the size of the uh, scheme or the project is, uh, is changing. If as an advisor, I have advised the ministry 20 years ago that let's make 100 weavers cluster and give them the facility. A role model is Creative B. Let's give them the facility as that what we have created. And let's start with 100 weavers a cluster. But the moment five years down the line, you see the clusters have become like 10,000 weavers cluster. Now, any facility that is created for 10,000 weavers, automatically, why are we calling this sector a cottage industry? It's not an industry. Cottage industry means at cottage level, at village level, limited numbers, work. You don't need hi-fi industrial kind of machineries. You don't need CAD and computers. You know, you may, you, you may give them CAD and computers if there is an education in that particular village when the weavers children are educated or if any designer you can appoint to go to the rural area you can but most of the time uh, the the scenario is other way around uh, also i would not time does not permit to elaborate on this but uh, now we are talking about the uh, kabir product line kabir about three years ago why kabir and why not swadesh why not any any other name Kabir is very personal name because I have been uh, inspired by the Sufi music uh, and uh, Kabir's poems where simplicity and uh, self-sufficiency has been uh, taught. He himself was a very humble, poor weaver, but a poet and a highly skilled weaver. So Kabir was just my own concept, but under Kabir, you forget that it's called Kabir, you call anything. But under that umbrella, I'm talking about the handloom of the whole country. The villages which are 100 kilometers away from the highway or say 200 kilometers from the town, the produce of that village of handloom, handicraft, whatever, how is that being marketed? Where is it going? It is not a designer handloom. It's not a designer product. Now, I have been successful in three decades to put my designer brand and the company on a, on a global map. I have very ardent uh, export buyers who are buying from me best quality that I have recreated and reinvented the weaves and made. But that is not even a drop in the ocean because I, uh, we can give employment to few hundred. We can train few thousand, but there are few lakhs 
weavers and artisans across the country and where is that one platform marketing platform which will take care so my uh, dialogue with the corporates and big companies and those who want to use their csr funds last three years have been still not really i must say not successful yet but i've been trying to influence them saying that you keep designer product line separately and you have very un uh, unassuming kind of modest looking stores across the country for products which are produced and collected directly by your team no mediator no in between traders between big company a retail chain and the village weaver there are about four uh, other cost adding factors which you should rule out you have to study properly and see that at what level you can cut down the cost so that you can pay five rupees more to the artisan and sell your product at a very competitive price as retail as a retailer so uh, don't just get stop at a hub of a town where trading is happening of handloom just build the skill in 3 years we have trained 2000 women to do everything procurement sourcing so you as a big conglomerate big company you could do that you can have under your own pay scale have we uh, have youth trained at village level and town level for procurement have out of the city warehouses which you can afford you already may have so collect produce from different villages and straight away ship it to your retail chain stores and how many levels of uh, cost added cost that you are cutting and just give little timely payment to the artisan just give little uh, more that they need uh, and that that is the call of the day i conceived this concept before covid but post covid i find it very relevant and i have been meeting many large companies uh, who read about the article which was published i had to launch kabir as a pilot which i did before pandemic in my delhi franchise stores in gk1 and after that an article was written about it which was read by a couple of uh, large companies and they came across for meetings so i really hope that small or big any enterprise come forward and adopt this formula i don't have a, a commercial ambition on this kabir is just my brain child as an expert on handloom industry i call myself an expert because i have analyzed i have di diagnostic uh, solution for the industry and uh, i have i have done designer handloom i have been shown at lakme fashion week international shows my last uh, show in hamburg was just before covid it was a full one day session i was invited at india week uh, to by gothe centrum and uh, hamburg cultural ministry to do one day session on uh, sustainable fashion i am stuck i'm sorry with this slide there is lot to show these are the kabir products that i'm talking about see these are woven everywhere i haven't we haven't designed them this is banket giri look at the skill and do you think this skill is available plentiful no with the senior weavers who are in banket giri with them this phase may end so every year we lose couple of techniques from india which have been uh, like our pride techniques and just about 100 150 years ago we were thriving on these beautiful technique textiles and i am now quickly looking i'm not looking at my watch but i think i may have just about 5 or 10 minutes now uh, i'm showing the hamburg collection just for the audience those who are into designing those who have been who are the business owners that transition from a designer handloom uh, from the ordinary handloom to a designer handloom uh, if you make a structure if you get some csr funding and help that cluster of weavers uh, then it is possible but otherwise keep a distinct two labels in your store this is a lakme fashion week you see where kalamkari has been given the highest quality and highest design value it was a entire hand painted and block printed kalamkari collection and look at the products that we make look at the product displayed behind me these are designer products but how many artisan i am supporting handful of them come forward you audience you could be a researcher or a owner of a large company or a company of a cosmetic brand you know anyone just adopting a village or handful of weavers and and taking them ahead is not difficult so 
uh, these are just 100% hand woven, hand processed, natural diet. Uh, and look at the surface ornamentation and look at the style. If we could clothe the world then, why not now? Now the whole world wants sustainable, biodegradable textiles, environment friendly textiles. Who's going to make these textiles? Weavers, our own weavers. And weavers have to be given equal respect or more respect when we work with them because they are the big designers. We are nothing in front of them. Um, but they need equipment, they need infrastructure, they need flowing water. So is it difficult for any group of enthusiasts to approach a company or say Vishwa, Vishwa.org and say, I want to raise funds for a village. They don't have flowing water, so their colors are bleeding. I want to uh, help, you know, stock good quality yarn to so-and-so village. Can I raise about a couple of lakhs for this community? It is possible for any small level or a large level of process is the call of the day that we all get together and start doing. This is hand-painted kalamkari on various textures. Now coming to the knowledge. We had the knowledge. We are in the process of losing the knowledge. And there are a couple of us in the country, handful of us who have done immense R&D and arrived to a kind of a knowledge that we need to, uh, you know, need for our weaves to go ahead, our weavers to go ahead, our textiles to gain the reputation again as we had. So we have the United Nations uh, collaboration happening where the groups being sent from across the globe, whichever country that we uh, accept uh, to design, uh, take the implementing project for them. Uh, and you see how enthusiastic the world is to learn your techniques. So why are we not giving that pride to our own techniques? And my message today is that uh, let's small way or big way, uh, because the pandemic had been really harsh. You know how many hundreds of weavers have given up weaving? In my own record, say if I'm in touch with 5,000 weavers across the country, that I'm, I am, because I've been telling the corporate companies that I can connect you to 5,000 different producer groups to launch Kabir if you want to. You may call it anything else. So out of these hundreds from each village have given up weaving and moved to a security job or in nearby town, any job, because for it's not even six months or eight months, we did ration distribution with donate card and with all other, like Vishwa may have also uh, in future may come up with such, but how much help it would do, a ration of a month is nothing. So this is my last slide. Please look at the smile, look at the future of these children, look at, think of the uh, future of next generation where we are crying about global warming. Why can't we embrace our own old techniques, support the weavers and take them forward? And uh, beyond, these are the children at Creative Bee Dye Farm. They were born there, they go to a nice English medium, Pudumi school, and they are very happy growing up in the natural environment, so as their parents. Um, so now, um, I think this is my last slide, and if time is still there, I would, uh, any topic that Mrs. Srivani would want me to elaborate on, I can, or we can move on to the Q&A session. Yes. Uh, over to Srivani. Yes. I would like to say a little bit about Vishwa Talk. Vishwa Talk is a space to exp expand the horizons of our minds, to bring in social change in our country. Each webinar, we call experts from different fields to discuss, to examine opinions, issues, problems, and get different perspectives. Each webinar, is an interactive session. When we walk, all walk away from here, we want to walk away with more respect for each other and a deeper understanding of this topic that we speak in this, in this talk. I remember reading that in the third century BC, the Roman Empire, emperor had banned Indian handlooms in Rome because of the Indian handlooms, the gold was going out of Rome into India. And uh, he did, he banned, but the women of that country refused. 
they started continued to still buy our cloth. That is our handloom industry. That is what we need to be proud about. Today, as you know, many weaves have already gone extinct. Many techniques have, have already been lost. Here is a call to those who can, those industrialists, those high net worth individuals, those people, big or small, who can make a difference to adopt our handloom industry. We do have, we, the request is that pick up and become custodians of our wealth, our handloom industry. We have people like Ms. Pina who have given a lifetime, a lifetime, sacrifice their lives to protect our weaves, our heritage. We need to respect that. We need to be understanding of that. We need to be generous to that. We need to share the importance with people in our community and the need of the art. Because if we continue to not support our handloom weavers, their children who have knowledge coming from centuries are now going to be your security guards, your pewns, your cleaners. Can such talented people be allowed to be that? When a child goes to the mother and says, you spent a lifetime weaving, what did you earn? 300 a month, a day, 50 rupees a day? You, you've done a beautiful painting of a Kalamkari Dupatta. You took 15 days to do it and you're getting 500 rupees for it. Don't expect me to become a weaver. Don't expect me to follow your profession. So the call, the need of the hour is that we, the few people who are still aware of this situation, for us to bring in this awareness across our country, bring in a movement. Yes, we need marketplaces. Marketplaces where the customer and the weaver do not have middlemen. There is a need of the hour for corporates to start these stores like Kabir. There's a need of the hour for corporates to support people like Ms. Bina. We have them, they have the knowledge, we need to support them to protect the lacks of weavers in our country whose next generation will no longer be weavers if we don't support them today. So we can take a question or two now. Mr. Virendra ji, do you have a question? Yeah, good morning and I appreciate the initiative by Vishwata. Uh, thanks for the information given by Vinara uh, madam. See, I am mean, uh, a practicing psychologist in Hyderabad. I been uh, connected with the different artists. I also uh, interacted with the uh, viewer societies in uh, Telangana, starting from Siddhi uh, Pet, Sirsila. We were seriously work to improvise their mental health during the suicides of many viewers in Sirsila. We have uh, designed some programs so that uh, they can uh, really empower themselves to be more content to lead their life uh, in respect of their uh, situations. Uh, Madam, I have a query regarding uh, why this uh, handloom uh, uh, clothes which are produced in different places, maybe Siddhipet or Sirsila or Samsana and Purun Algunda uh, areas, why can't uh, create the uh, say awareness in the same towns? See, there are so many, uh, as you said, that there are fashionable things you can convert from the weave to fashion market, uh, designing into the fashion market. In the colleges and universities, as well as in the same own town, not much awareness is being given uh, to the latest uh, young people or old people. Was there any action plan? Was there, madam? I really. Uh, 
May I uh, take his question, Ms. Swami? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, very sensitive points that I have deliberately missed in my today's topic is uh, the, con the situation that has come up post GST for the yarn and uh, also the, the price escalation in uh, every ingredient that a weaver is using. Now, you have heard me saying that we had a barter system just 100 years ago. Our own village produce was worn by our own village women and men. Okay. Now, today, if you go to Odisha, all women are wearing mill printed Odia design synthetic semi synthetic saris. Why? Because they can't afford their own product. Their own product, yarn, has become so expensive. Now, we were any small weaver that's why see all the points that i mentioned today if you ponder over them it's linked together education i'm talking about a weaver is not educated enough to make a gst registration so he's an unregistered dealer so he's buying the yarn with gst but he's not been able to claim the input so the yarn gst with GST Sorry, uh, no see in villages or towns yeah. If we were really pro get the yarn from the uh, dealer and then they get it and give back to the the wholesaler. Yeah. Even even the wholesaler. I, I am from Siddipet. I have been uh, surrounded with the many of the weavers family since yeah. from childhood days to till now. Okay. So those only only uh, few one or two families are, are from the same weaver community. They collect the saris which are given by the other families and these people will like, export or okay. market. So my, my, my concern is, uh, why can't the same dealer hmm. is fail to create an awareness in the same town? Siddipet, you take yeah. such a big city now. Very, very few people could really reach out to those people. No, I wouldn't say that awareness is not there. I'm sure awareness is there because uh, dealers are putting up uh, banners uh, outside their uh, shop. And you know, the shops are in the mainstream marketplaces. It is the affordability because who's buying your hand now? That is the question. So I, I, if I, there was a time, I would divide even my clientele into three segments. The one clientele, which is looking for a fashionable yet handmade because they have that aware intellectual uh, sensibility to think that yes, by buying this particular piece, I'm supporting a viewer. So they want to buy handwoven, yet they want to uh, buy a fashionable handwoven because the kind of society that they're moving in, they, they need uh, uh, fashionable garments. So a designer handloom client, that is. Okay, then there is a client who wants to be comfortable. 40 plus, 50 plus women and men want to have a very non-synthetic comfortable attire. They want to buy also handloom. They want to also buy handloom towels, honeycomb, Siddipet and Dubak and all those areas make beautiful towels, right? There's a large uh, towel weaver society which has been crying for help, you know, and requesting for help. So we want to buy these. They want to buy these, but the cost is a factor again, you know, because uh, a teacher or a college professor or a assistant doctor or who are on a government salary or any other non-IT salary can afford to buy the handloom or not. And why handloom has become expensive? Not because weavers are making money, because the ingredients have become expensive. So these are the policy matters and uh, that we have no answers to. But uh, you know, only thing what one can do is, as Mrs. Vani again and again repeated my own, uh, my, my recommendations that big companies have to come forward and they can have say 200% profit is what any other company is adding the big value chain because their overheads are high or 150%. But you have a segment of, say that's why an online platform which, which is needed now for retail is not uniform commission from everyone. Now, if you study, uniform commission is taken even a weaver or an NGO or a designer and then where the products will sell. So um, there is any subsidy that government give you or any society, since you are in Sirsila, I would tell you that government has done immense effort to keep that Sirsila live. I also had a formula for Sirsila to make it like a Sirsila weave, which is like as famous as Mangalgiri. I also told government, the local government, whenever there was an opportunity that we could develop instead of power loom, a whole large 5,000 weavers facility in Sirsila, where people are hungry for the fashion fabrics which Mangalgiri is losing on to now. And Mangalgiri is in Andhra Pradesh. We yes. are in 
Kerala. We need, we don't have any such uh, fashion fabric. We have ikat, we have uh, all other, uh, you know, decorative fabrics, but we don't have solid plain fabrics, which fashion industry demands. And Sitsila has the uh, capacity to Siddipet and Sitsila can produce that. And that again, will go back to power loom. Power loom will catch it from us, but designers are there. Experts are there to give you formula to protect it. So that's my answer. So I, I, I do. I can ask one question. Last question. Please. We'll continue the questions after the program because in the last time, time. No, I am having my sessions after that. Yeah. Madam, my question is when I interact with the, many of the uh, viewers, they raised, uh, I could understand there are two, three issues. One is their mental health, well being. Second is, uh, you know, their um, uh, skills in managing the money. Uh, though it is not related, but I thought I just wanted to know was there any programs designed by anybody so that the viewers can understand their mental health as well as the uh, understand the money? Uh, about the mental health, I am not sure, but about the money, my next uh, program that I was just discussing with uh, Mrs. Shivani of the uh, webinar that I want women viewers, senior viewers, middle aged women to be educated enough to manage their own money. You know, that's the key thing because yeah. if the money as the cash comes home, the woman, though working so hard, and men also working hard, not seeing a light of the day next day. The money is just appearing. So education is a key. And all the NGOs and all people who are involved in education, I myself, uh, I'm very passionate about design education. And that's what makes me affiliated to so many design schools. Uh, education is number one. Secondly, uh, policies, if can, anyone has an influence over the government. And if we can bring yarn and all other supply out of uh, GST, regime so that you know it becomes cheaper and moreover more webinars and more uh, awareness can be created uh, global warming is anyway forcing all of us to to move towards handmade if not today when we are all gone and when the skills are all gone the world is going to cry for handwoven power which does not use electricity see creative farm is a role model because we don't use electricity at any level of finishing our production but 30 years down the line, believe me, the whole world will come to India and say, give us clothes because we don't have electricity. We don't have power. We, you have solar power. So let's some NGO take up weavers colonies or printers colonies, give them solar power. Solar power is not easy for a weaver organization to bear the cost. So, so yeah. I would like to thank uh, Ms. Bina. I would like to tell the participants, Ms. Bina also conducts workshops in um, block printing, shibori, and uh, batik. So please sub, please join and get to know about these uh, techniques. Thanks. I would like to thank Ms. Bina once again for coming into our program. Thank you. Next is we would, I would like to thank each of the participants for um, participating in this program and making it a huge uh, success. We would like you all to share this with people around you about what we need to do for our handloom industry. I would also like to thank Vishwa team. You all have done a fantastic job this uh, event. Environment, handlooms, these are things that nobody is interested. You talk about education, we will have 500 participants. Talk about environment, talk about handlooms, there are hardly people who are in interested in it. But this is the area that our team has really put in to make a difference. Thank you so much. I would like to also thank uh, uh, Biological Events for supporting Roshni Trust in their fundraiser. Thank you so much. Thank you Nabad for supporting another fundraiser of ours from uh, a small school in Bhimavar in the West Kodavri district. Thank you so much. Now we have come up with two new, uh, three new, um, Two new uh, fundraisers. One is with Parampara. Art and artists have suffered a lot this COVID times. They have they had no work in the last two three years. They had no income, and we need to not only support them. We need to encourage them. We need to cherish them. We need to nourish them. We need to acknowledge them. To do that, Parampara Foundation has come up with a small dance competition for Bharatnatyam and Kuchpudi. 
the prize monies for the top winners are 50,000, 20,000, 10,000. We would like people to support these prize monies and to conduct this event. Please donate generously to this event or share it with people who have the capacity to donate, please. We have to support our heritage and our artists. Secondly, there is Ms. Oron Navy, who is a German born and brought up in Tamil Nadu. She's given her life. These are change makers who have given their lives 10 years, 20 years, 30 years of their life. They have contributed. She's taken up 30 acres of barren land and converted it into a lush forest filled with insects, birds, animals. She has worked with her hands with a team of 15 people and created this lush forest. Now she requests for a excavator, which can be, if anybody can donate it or know people who can donate it, please share it with them. We need people like this. We need our environment to be taken care of. Thirdly, there is another new fundraiser which has come up now from Bal Vikas. Here is a man called Sham Sundar who's given his lifetime to support the deaf and the dumb. In his school, speech therapy is, is taught, given to these students, and then skills are being taught to them. We in Vishwa are supporting him in funding a few teachers by paying their salaries. If there's anybody who would like to adopt a teacher, so that you know at least 20 students, 30 students, speech is taken care of. That is our last request. With this, we close Vishwa Talks. And for those of you who would like to continue asking questions, Shiv Kumar Beli, please unmute yourself. Thank, thank you, Shivani ma'am, and thank you, Bina ma'am. It was a really wonderful session uh, because uh, you touched upon many aspects from the perspective of design, art, uh, culture, heritage, people uh, who are involved in it. Uh, one interesting theme that uh, I'm always interested in, you really uh, uh, elaborated it much, which is about designer and artisan interaction uh, or intervention or designer and uh, uh, weaver in, uh, intervention because both of them, they come from different uh, space. As you mentioned, designer comes from very methodical, uh, so-called educated uh, setup and weaver from his own uh, culture and his own lineage, he brings a lot of uh, you know, value to the, uh, to the, to, to the art. Mm -hmm. But now this intervention, designer weaver intervention is a new phenomenon. Maybe from the last uh, five or six years it has picked up uh, very much and we can see a lot of things happening on the international uh, fashion uh, shows also. So how do you see this phenomena is really beneficial and value to the people, basically for the, for the viewers? And uh, if it is a mutually beneficial or is it a skew towards one party, maybe a designer more being credited or viewer? How, how do you see this phenomena happening? Uh, it's a very good question and uh, if there was uh, enough time, I would have been speaking more about it then. Um, see, there are two aspects of it. Whenever I go to a design school or a fashion like Lakme like Fashion Week want me to talk to big designers, uh, audience, I say that please don't show uh, your one collection in Ajrak or one collection in Kalamkari and just leave that craft. Don't think that it is one of your choices between a China brocade or a China velvet and then Ajrak, you know, if you are choosing Ajrak or Kalamkari or Ikat or any other weave or say you develop a special weave in Sirsala, Siddipet, at least support that community for six months, one year, two years and try to know what they want. When you have a handful of designs from your US, European, Japanese buyers, go to them and you know that they have the skill. They know that you have the order to create that ecosystem. They don't have the ecosystem. And if you are impatient, you just make one quick flying visit to the village and say, this is the design and this is how you have to do it. And we were so much in need and he would also agree for it. He would not even look at the yarn price index and he'll commit to you the price. But the yarn price index, if you all don't know, that changes like egg price every day. If I have taken an order, export order last month at 4,800 was the silk price. Now 5,600 is the silk price now. So uh, ecosystem and providing them whatever they need, which is very minimal, you know, and this is the least a designer can do. And if you do this, also acknowledge them. 
there is see if you put on your product saying woven in sirsila or woven in koelgudam i don't think any of your retail client is going to walk to koelgudam and take away your uh, usp that you have worked with so and so weaver you know so give them the due credit and that is what they weavers are very proud and very very sensitive uh, people i have seen them struggle through pandemic as everyone else could go for all jobs but weavers could not what do they do what work they will do they are creative people they are respected they are padma shalis padma shali is a very very uh, good status to their name and their family name and so give them that and uh, and then it's a matter of 15 20 days you just work with a group of weavers give them whatever they want and then you get back whatever you need and the result believe me will be 90% and you in your uh, product tag will always say that handloom is hand woven and irregularity of weaves and prints are accepted and are the character of hand woven textiles and your buyers won't have anything to say with that and don't reject see my sustainable formula began 30 years ago i had made a policy then that we would not reject anything that is produced by weaver so at creative b you have a discounted section with uh, because so many hands are touching your a process it's a multi uh, process value chain and imagine a kanjivaram sari pure white sari with uh, say about 10000 words gold on it staying on weaver's loom for more than a month or upada sari for that reason and the loom is where it's not in any special studio air conditioned studio it's in his house where children are playing around that is where is their bedroom maybe in a part they they, they have the kitchen so it is very possible that some stain something will come up in six sarees one saree may come up with so 20% is your damage in handloom production which you as a producer has to absorb and not the weaver you are a creative person on the other edge you have 101 ways to convert the damage fabric or even tell people stories and say that yes see in this process it got damaged and believe me at creative b all celebrities have been coming film stars have been coming and going straight to that corner because that corner has some of the most beautiful textiles but with small hole some some flaw of weaving or print it has been kept there so uh, as a designer uh, if you have taken my message right adopt a community and start working you are not late for spring summer 2020 2022 and 23 so adopt cotton weavers somewhere nearby wherever you are uh, 10 of them and uh, see what they want you are equipped with the color trends of 2022 spring summer start working and tell me come back to me next year and say what is it. thank you so much at this the last question was answered you've been very patient <laughs> Uh, thank you for taking in a lot of questions <laughs> that's my passion and um, rani you know that i would not stop at uh, looking at my i wouldn't even look at my watch thank you very much vishwa team and shivani and the audience yeah thank you once again to all the participants who've been so patiently listening and to the vishwa team